how would you advise someone that had good ideas, was probably doing okay, to kind of leverage some of the tools that that are available now for marketing uh, in order to lift lift their audience? I, I think you have to be really, really cautious about getting sucked into the world of vanity metrics as it relates to social media. So t tell me, Peter, how do you hold the hand of somebody, you know, that's looking to take an idea, uh, have have some great thoughts and, and, and leverage it? How do they commercialize these ideas and become a very successful, uh, very wealthy uh, person who also happens to contribute to society? Great, so this is where everybody wants the three hacks to success. Um, you're not gonna get them, sorry. Hey there, before we get started, I wanna share something really important with you. I started The Few with one thing in mind, and that was to help you close the gap between what you want and where you are today to live the life you've always dreamed of. We've scoured the world to find the best guests to inspire you on that journey. Who better to learn how to be one of the few than those that already are? Individuals that do live life on their terms and have achieved their life dream. Subscribe to The Few with Boo now. Join our community. If you find these episodes valuable, the more subscribers we have, the more listeners we get, the greater the guests we bring on the show. To subscribe now, hit the button and let's dive into this episode of The Few. Welcome back everyone to another episode of The Few. Hopefully for some of you listeners, you've gone from dream just out of reach to in fingertip touch, uh, almost maybe even grasped it. Uh, our guest today, I know people are going to be super engaged with. Uh, why do I know that? Because the question our guest today answers is a question I get a lot of the time, which is how did you become a keynote speaker? How do you turn what you do into your life into something that actually generates a, an income? And it's not easy is the bottom line. And it takes time. And it's very, uh, once you kind of understand the, the methodology on the way to get there, it becomes pretty exciting. So with no further ado, I'm going to introduce him now, Peter. Uh, Peter Winnick, thank you so much for being on the, on the feud today and helping those of us that have got some great ideas, turn them into reality and into, into a commercially viable uh, idea. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here today. I've got a quick question for you, Peter. Very simply, what's a thought leader? <laughs> so that it's, I love that you asked that question because people banter this world word around. Um, and, you know, the word that used to make me cringe was guru. Remember when everyone was a guru? Um, I've been in the thought leadership space since before it was borderline cringeworthy term, which bothers me. So, yeah. But, but um, what I believe a thought leader is, I think there's two components to that answer. Number one is thought, okay? So what you are doing is, whether it's, it's coming from academia, whether it's coming from your business experience, whether it's coming from your life experience, there's something thoughtful about what you're doing, about what you have to say, about your processes, your methodologies, your frameworks, your beliefs. Your, your, what is the grounded foundation of your work? Well, there's gotta be some thought there. The second piece is the leadership piece, which is really the, the critical component, which is, do you have the courage to, whether it's standing on the, you know, the proverbial shoulders of giants or whatever, to take the conversation to the next level, maybe in a slightly different way, not being controversial for the sake of, you know, shock value, but do you have the courage to add to the conversation in a way that's deliberate and thoughtful and all that? So you add the two together, thought leadership. Because that's the reality. It's very easy to be a deep thinker and have all the big ideas and stay in the crowd. When you lift up and start to open yourself to challenge and for people to look at that those ideas and maybe have a, an alternate uh, perspective, it's yeah, that's that's where the courage comes in. When it, what is it about somebody that turns their thoughts and thoughts are you know a dime a dozen? It's pretty easy to sit there and get lost lost in your thoughts, but actually convert them into something that's structured that's meaningful, that's impactful. And I guess give them a, a fixed narrative in which to bring a lot of their conversations back because that's one of your core philosophies, right? You've got to have the core idea. You've got to have something. It, so I would say at the risk of sounding like a consultant, it depends, right? So there's a whole universe of what I would call leadertainment, which is primarily keynote speaking, right? So that's one way to ask. One way to answer that question is how do I take what I know and put it on stage in 30, 45 minutes in an engaging way, an insightful way, in a way that people want to listen to. That goes back to storytelling. That goes back to your executive presence. That goes back to 
visuals and music and all, you know, all these other things. The way I'd prefer to answer that question is how do you make what you have replicatable and teachable? How do you break it down to the, to the Lego piece level, to the atomic level? Um, and the way to do that is to really make sure that what you say is what you say is so is so right. So if I say to you, uh, uh, you know, Hey boo, if I, you know, if you, uh, pat your head on the three, you know, on the, pat yourself on the head three times and drink chicken soup, uh, you're going to be more resilient. It's just not so. So we have to know that the models and the methods and the frameworks are actually so, so there's science underneath this. You could, you, you know, you could validate an assessment. You could prove it through research. And I think the difference between the two, the leadertainment piece and the teaching piece is charisma is going to get you really far on the stage, right? Nobody wants to see uh, an actuary read a report and call that a keynote, but doesn't mean it's replicatable and teachable. Maybe, maybe not. It's a different skill set. And I think that's really where, where, uh, where the rubber meets the road as it relates to scale and leverage. And are there, do you have a like a fixed idea or is there a fairly routine set of, of avenues in which you can deliver your intellectual property and thoughts in a way that can be monetized or is there, you, you, you still have a bit of a structure, right? Yeah. 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 So the structure or how do you get it out there is really a tactical question. I prefer to start at the strategic, right? So, you know, should I be on TikTok? Should I write a book? Should I write an article? Blah, blah, blah. Those are all tactical questions that in the absence of a solid viable strategy, uh, you're never going to be able to answer optimally. You might get it okay, but it's not the optimal way to answer that question. So to me, the way you get there is the first thing you need to do is have a strategy. And in my experience, most thought leaders, whether current or aspiring thought leaders, either don't have one, have an antiquated one or broken one. So you've got to spend the time and energy to develop a strategy which speaks to who am I serving, right? Because who you're serving drives a lot of your tactical answers. Where do they consume content? How do they prefer to consume it? Where do they add the most value to it, right? Um, how do I sell it? You know, the, the reality is in my work, 70, 80%, maybe more of the energy that we put in with clients is really more on the sales, marketing, productization, distribution side. People can't come to us and say, hey, I don't have an idea. Make me a thought leader. Sorry, if, if I can't do that, right? Um, you could have a kernel of an idea or a, a, an incredibly evolved, developed idea. We, you know, we can kick butt and get it to market, productize it, make it consistent, get it out there, et cetera. But again, that's a function of strategy. You talk about the Gartner hype cycle, and it's, a, it's actually a slide I use on a lot of my presentations around uh, yeah, we don't have an ideas problem. We've got an execution of ideas problem. Where does that, um, it, and it's interesting that that model is the same as the, as the failed startup business model. It's the same as the product launch model. It's the, everyone gets excited by the big idea and the start of the adventure. But once you're in the jungle and you're starting to chop down the vines of the trees, although it gets a little bit, um, and I've always called it the trough of despair before the slope of enlightenment. But in, in the context of thought leaders, what does that look like? What, is a, what does the hype cycle look like for them? Yeah, so I think for an emerging thought leader, the the quickest the, the trick is to emerge, meaning to to you know academics, um, for example, and speaking in generalities, I know that tend to be on one side of the continuum, where they want to get something right to the seventeenth decimal point before they show it to their spouse. Right? That's just how they're wired. It's because in that world, it's about perfection and it's about um, not having your peers and colleagues globally beat you up and punching a hole in it. I think the opposite is true for thought leaders and like, okay, we are all horrible judges of what is good and what is bad in terms of our ideas, right? There are times where um, I've got what I think is the most brilliant idea and I put it out there and it's like, you know, crickets. There are other times where I think I'm embarrassed to hit send or post or whatever, because I think, oh my God, do I even want my name associated with that? It's a horrible, stupid thing. And that's the thing that blows up. So I think number one, separate the process by which you decide what a good idea is and take yourself out of that equation. Get it out there in small bits and pieces. This is where platforms like LinkedIn and everything else are the greatest tools ever invented because we can come out, out there really quickly with the kernel of an idea. A little, you, know, you don't have to spend six months on this thing. Put it out there and go, is this resonating? And put it out there to those that you think it would value, you know, would, would assign a value to it the most and listen and iterate and listen and iterate and get your ego out of the way and say, all right, Peter, I'm fine to say, geez, the thing that I thought was a great idea, it's crap, out, garbage, next. As to, to your point, 
the, idea, the shortage of ideas is never the problem. The shortage of ideas is a problem. Get a job and do something else. This isn't the space for you. Yeah, it's, you, and you talk about the three-legged stool. Uh, is, that, is that a concept which is around uh, turning uh, thoughts and the chaos of ideas into some sort of structure? What, what, are you, what are you trying to achieve there when we talk about that for a thought leader? Um, well, once there is confirmation or confidence that what you have has a market, now the question is, how do you get it to the market? There's lots of different ways to get ideas to market, some for money and some not for money. So you got to figure out also sort of where is that paywall for you? And, you know, a thing that uh, I totally disagree with is a lot of people, you know, stay in uh, sort of stealth mode. Oh, I can't tell you all my good ideas because if I told you, you'd steal them from me. No, that's not true. There are people that won't hire you, that, that won't buy your book, that won't buy your tools, whatever. They were never clients. And you have to think of that as a small subset of the potential market. Now, if the only market for your stuff is free, that's a problem. But I think that's a marketing problem, not, not, a, uh, not a problem that speaks to the quality or lack thereof of the idea. When, when people sell and you I inevitably as an entrepreneur end up in, in, a, in a model of constantly driving sales because that's what you need to put a put roof over your head, right? Uh, when you look at a thought leader, uh, a, a lot of them are, are pathologically terrified of sales or, or, or ever having a conversation about monetizing, monetizing their thought. So what, what makes the difference? What is it, what's the difference between someone that managed to, to break through that? Like in your experience, you've worked with a lot of thought leaders, you've got a lot of books to market, what are some of the attributes or belief structures that you've got to uh, adapt to be able to get good at, let's call it inverted commas, sales? So, so great conversation. I think maybe single digits of thought leaders, five, seven, eight percent, whatever, happen to be good at sales and marketing for whatever reason. That's what that was their career. That's what they did. They were a CMO to a big company, whatever, whatever, whatever. Right. And it's just natural for them. And that's what they do. Now, for the other 95 percent. It's not, and they probably didn't get into the business side of thought leadership to become salesperson of the year at their company. So the question becomes, what needs to be marketed and what needs to be sold? Those two terms are not synonyms. They're very, very different things. The next question on top of that is who doesn't need to be you. And my argument would be, if you have, as the thought leader, are always the head of sales talking to the client. The only one that will win is the client. Either you're going to reduce the price, give them more stuff. Not it's it's uncomfortable. Like imagine, you know, if you went to the doctor and as the doctor's telling you the surgery they need, they're saying, oh, by the way, and there's two ways I can do this. It's, you know, $20,000 to, to retach your retina, or there's a better way that's 25,000. You know, like that would just be weird, right? But that's in essence, the awkwardness on both sides that happens. So I think the smart thought leaders or the, or the ones that are more proficient in this, when it comes to sales, they've figured out how to have others support them in that process. And even if they're good at it to, to feign sort of naivete, oh, I don't, I don't dirty my hands with dollars. It's it's the old, uh, whenever you go to buy a car, you're never dealing with one person, are you? You're dealing with the, the car salesman and the manager in the back room. He has to check whether he can adjust the price. And, and I think that's just the the, the nature of sales. Um, but again, you're having having interviewed a lot of thought leaders and, and seen the difference between the very commercially successful ones and the and the ones that seem to struggle all the time. There's not a lot of difference between the, the value of their ideas. It's just the value they attach to their idea. Well, and, and you're, you're totally right, Boo. So in most other businesses and most other markets, if there was one product that was $50,000 and one that was $5,000, and I'm not going to tell you what the industry is, we, we would probably agree that the $50,000 one has more features, is a higher quality, is, is scarcer, is, is more rare, is more powerful, whatever, whatever. The reality is in the keynote world, the dollars don't necessarily assign to the quality of the keynoter. It could be the brand they built, the reputation they have, the scarce they built, whatever. I've seen five thousand dollar keynoters that are better some than some that are fifty or a hundred. You know, so it's just weird. It's just a, a a nuance or an oddity or a quirk in the marketplace. With regard to having someone that kind of helps you out as a thought leader, when you when you start as a thought like when you start as a human being in the world of social media and presence, you have zero followers, yeah, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have. Uh, thought i wouldn't call an influencer a thought leader but you have people that have millions and millions of followers now often some of that 
the 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 high uh, the the grabby high volume large audience type of of content isn't really very thought leaderish. In fact, it's the opposite end of the spectrum. So, how would you advise someone that had good ideas, was probably doing okay, to kind of leverage some of the tools that that are available now for marketing uh, in order to lift lift their audience? I think you have to be really, really cautious about getting sucked into the world of vanity metrics as it relates to social media. So, right. So drawing a conclusion that says so-and-so has a million followers, therefore they're really influential. Well, in a certain space, in a certain sphere with certain industries or products or whatever, that's probably absolutely so. But the reality is, as a thought leader, do you even know the size of your marketplace? Right. You know, if, if you're only trying to influence CIOs at Fortune 1000 companies, by definition, your, the, the, your potential market is 1000, right? So when I, I was talking to a very well-known author, had five New York Times bestselling books, and he said, you know, I've sold a lot of books, um, five copies of five of my different books, each made me between a million and three. I just don't know which five they were. So is it important to have the right following? Yes. The gross number isn't actually the right one. I would, I would want to know sort of the related to your avatars, who you're trying to connect with. Are you getting those followers connect, you know, fo are you getting the right people to follow you? And more importantly, what do we really want them to do? Because the, the size of our audience is an ego play, right? You know, um, I have a podcast, I've done 550 episodes. We get about 5,000 downloads a month, which is okay in the podcasting world, not rock science. I've never sold a nickel in advertising but I can directly attribute mil literally millions of dollars to the show, either people that have reached out to us because they've listened to an episode or someone that wanted to be a guest or, or, or there's three or four different categories there. So people look at our stuff and say, well, there's no advertising, not making any money. That's not the model that we use there. We're using that to build the brand, to develop relationships, et cetera, et cetera. You made a great point there, which is the the, the ego attached to audience. And yeah, I think a lot of thought leaders think, hey, I was great in manufacturing, I got these processes, the rest of the world would benefit from this. And their, their idea is to take their manufacturing experience and make it uh, generic. And every now and again, someone does. But by and large, you know, it, it is about them, uh, do you think, to just start with that niche and then kind of, kind of see what happens. I, I think everyone falls into that trap a little bit to say, Everything I do and everything I say has appeal to everybody. Well, and that's that's actually the worst thing you could do, right? So when I'm talking to, to a potential client and we talk about their work and their goals and said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll ask them, who do you think could benefit the most from this? Oh, this would work for everybody. And I'll say, great. Assuming you have you don't have the marketing budget of a Coca-Cola or a UPS, that's not the right answer. I'd rather someone tell me with the highest level of specificity, this works really well for... Uh, uh, family businesses, second generation in a family business in manufacturing in the Midwest doing between 50 and 150 million bucks. I got it now. Now I know exactly who that's going to work for. And I can spend my time and energy and effort and dollars wisely focusing on that population, not, you know, 90% of the world that couldn't care less about who I am and what I do. Yeah, absolutely right. So I've got I've got three groups of three questions for you. Okay, the first question. Wait, my math isn't that great, but that's a total of nine that, that questions. Is, that is nine questions. The, the context isn't isn't too different between them. So the first the first question is in the context of somebody that believes they they have some great ideas and they could be a thought leader. Uh, in the first year of, of them emerging, what would be the three things they should focus on the most? Oh, that's a good question. I think the three things would be locking down their thought leadership because early thought leaders tend to, you know, if you talk to them in three weeks later, you talk to them again in three weeks again, it's different. Lock and load, lock and load, right? You can't be all things to all people. I think number two would be an understanding of your market. Uh, and then the third would be, how do you initially get those ideas out to uh, representative subsets of your market for them to make the decision that you deserve to be a thought leader? Oh, and by the way, I implied in all of this is never, ever, 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 ever call yourself a th thought leader. That's when you do that, that just signals arrogance and naivete and uh, just please. Uh, so is, is that always a book in terms of how you get your thought out, out there? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, books would be like, you know, someone, someone's 40 pounds overweight 
and the doc says you should start working out and they go, I'm going to run the marathon this weekend because it's in town. That's not going to be a good outcome. Books, there's, a, there's reasons to write book. There's purpose to write a book. But, you know, a, a book's a heavy lift. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money, takes a lot of energy. For very, very few, right out of the gate is the book the answer. Now, an asterisk to that might be, well, someone with a lot of notoriety, former CEO of a Fortune 1000, or they've already got an audience or whatever, whatever. But for most, that's not the way you want to you start the process. All right. The next series of three questions is you, you are a thought leader. You've had one book. And all of a sudden, uh, people aren't as interested in your idea as they were before. And you're finding yourself uh, struggling to, uh, to find relevance. What do you do to reinvigorate your, your, your brand? Well, I'm going to not answer the question the way you said it. So I'm going to take book as proxy for a body of thought leadership, if that's okay. Right? So sometimes there's a shelf life, no pun intended, where things go in cycles. So for example, before the pandemic, I was talking and potentially working with someone that was writing a book on the power of remote work. The book was released like Q1 of 2020. Holy cow, how lucky was that person, right? So early on in the pandemic, how we work remotely and work, blah, 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 like that was a big thing. Not so big now, why? We figured it out, right? You know, um, psychological safety was not something we were talking about for the most part, uh, three years ago. It's hot now. So I think you have to think about, is your thought leadership evergreen? You know, and in most cases it should be, don't tie it to a moment in time or try to catch a wave or, you know, whatever. But there are times where things just, um, you know, they go out of vogue. Like if, if you look at some of the, the, like the old school sales literature, breaking through the gatekeeper, that's not valid anymore. Right. Or I should say far less valid than it might have been 20 years ago or something. And what about uh, you're well established in your in your career now, and you get to the point where you feel like every idea has a thought leader, and that everyone is doing the same thing, and that there's 2.5 million speakers on LinkedIn, and the market is saturated with thought. What, what, where's what's the hope uh, for the uh, wizened uh, thought leader that becomes disenchanted with the with the the wannabes or the or the folks who really have a have an idea that's 12 inches wide and half an inch thick rather than I would say who cares right if I'm a thought leader and I love what I do and it, and and it's I'm serving my clients well and it's serving me well and 82 billion other people claim to be in my space who cares right where I would care is if it started to be damaging to the brand to the industry to the whatever so for example uh if you look at change management change management as a brand if you will is a damaged brand now because most people that have gone through some sort of a change management initiative think about it like a bad burrito that passed. So that it's been reborn as other things. Agile's kind of cool now, right? But you know, I wouldn't be bothered if a zillion other people are claiming to be in your space. I think that actually helps you competitively because it's elevating the conversation. More people are talking about it. And when you have real conversations with real clients, you've got the track record and the wannabes don't. And how about your journey, Peter? Look, how, how did you uh, at some point uh, uh, understand or believe, probably more importantly, uh, that this was your calling? Yeah, so for me, the the light bulb went on. It probably should have, should have went on much earlier. In that early, you know, the beginning of my career 30 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that now, um, we didn't call it thought leadership. I read a lot of books, read a lot of, ma read a lot of magazines and stuff. It was called being a nerd, right? That's what it was, right? And never once in the, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of books that I, I, I read uh, to date, did I look at a book and say, huh, I wonder how Boo makes a living. Like, I like this guy's stuff. What's his business model? Like, I bought the book, paid my 20, 30 bucks for the book, liked it, took an idea or two out of it, did something with it and whatever, right? Now that's all I do is, is think about that. Like, hey, how do you make a business out of that? And that that epiphany to me came, I was doing a turnaround actually for an Australian company 20 years ago. And that company uh, was really built on a book that a, a gentleman wrote in the late sixties on presentation skills and communication skills. And I'm like, whoa, that's pretty cool. Built a global business that's still here long after that person's gone. Um, so now I'm like, oh, wait, I am, I've always thought of myself as an entrepreneur and I always thought of myself as a nerd. Now it's like, psh, you know, all the entrepreneurial, uh, creativity and all that applied to now it's thought leadership sounds sexier than nerd 
Well, nerds have come quite sexy, you know. If you look at uh, TV and pop culture now, it's kind of cool to cool cool to be a nerd. Even fighter pilots now are embracing the nerd rather than the than the maverick. Uh, it's a it, it's it's cool cool to be smart. I think I'd rather a nerdy pilot than a maverick pilot, right? <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't we all? That's why when you're uh, when you're going into organisations and you're uh, talking about helping their performance, you don't lead with maverick. Uh, that's the last thing they want to have in the organisation is a room full of those guys. Um, so t- tell me, Peter. Ha- how do you hold the hand of somebody, you know, that's looking to take an idea, uh, have have some great thoughts, and 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 leverage it? I mean, I'm not talking about you know all the all the good things that happen in the world here. I'm talking the meat and ve- meat and veggies. How do they commercialize these ideas and become a very successful, uh, very wealthy uh, person who also happens to contribute to society? Great. So this is where everybody wants the three hacks to success. Um, You're not going to get them. Sorry. So uh, it's not quite that easy. I'm sure there's some clickbait somewhere that tells you, here's three things to be a million dollar speaker, if only. Right. So I think the journey is different. Uh, There's some common themes is different for everybody, depending on where your starting point is. So we work with people that are early into the space, moving from a stellar career as an entrepreneur or in corporate. We work with people that have published, you know, 20 books. We work with world-class academics, whatever. Depends where they are in the journey, and it depends where the thought leadership in is, is in its journey. It depends on their goals. Do you want to travel 300 days a year? Um, it depends on the competitive landscape. A lot of people that move into the thought leadership space, space are smart business people, but then I start to ask them a bunch of questions, right? So, if, Boo, if you and I were sitting around and had a couple cocktails and said, you know what, we're going to open a new pizza restaurant in downtown Charlotte, because we think there's a need there. The logical questions people would ask us is, well, what's your differentiation? Is it going to be uh, low price, high volume? Is it going to be high price, low volume? Is it going to be a wine bar? Who's your target market? What's your strategic event? Thought leaders don't do that, right? I always ask them, well, who's your competition? Oh, nobody. I have no competition. No, you haven't done your homework. And, and competition doesn't mean uh, Coke versus Pepsi. But who is out in the space doing similar things for similar organizations? And how are you better than, quicker than, cheaper than, faster than, whatever? And how are you going to win? But also, I guess, testing your theories as well, being open to understand that that maybe some people that are competitors uh, might have an advantage in that they've read more, have another study that you haven't read, and to be open-minded. I think think that, that, that humility, and that's, as you would have seen, it's the humble... Uh, individuals that grind it out, do the small things well, that ultimately thrive up to the top, right? So we we don't work in the B2C space, but every now and then I'll get somebody that'll talk to me and say, oh, I want to be the next Tony Robbins. I'm going to be the next Tony Robbins, right? And I say, hey, that's great. You know when we'll know? We'll know in 40 years because that's how long he's been in the game. And you want to get there in four weeks. Like that's, I mean, that's that's the world we live in, right? Everyone's looking for that instant hit, instant gratification, and preferably with no effort. If if that's if that. Uh, oh yeah, that would be good too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you just do it for me? And then when I when I'm rich, I'll give you some. I'll give you a kickback for all the effort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah that works. That works well. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Peter. Thoughtleadershipleverage.com is Peter's environment. Uh, where else, Peter, can people sort of find some of your your own uh, hmm, influence? Let's not call it thought leadership and great ideas. Yeah, so uh, very active on LinkedIn, YouTube channel, and then our podcast is a great place for people to get exposed to our ideas. So that's leveraging thought leadership. Awesome. Uh, those links will be in the show notes uh, below. Uh, Peter, we've knocked that one out in 30 minutes, which means that uh, you're incredibly succinct to the point and delivered enormous value for our listeners. So I truly appreciate that. And I'm very grateful. Or, or you've had enough of me and you're on to, you know, happy hours next or something. Either could be. Both could be. Just so everyone knows, it is almost five o'clock on a Friday. So yeah, there may be a little bit of that going on for both of us, for both of us. <laughs> Peter, really, really appreciate you, your time. Thanks so much for coming on the show, mate. Thanks for having me, Bill. Appreciate it.